All right, very good. Welcome, everyone. My name is Katrina Van Hus. I'm the CEO of Turnkey. We're a strategy and consulting company that works primarily on nonprofit revenue. So welcome. Glad that you're here. Um, today, we're going to talk about how American Heart has helped their constituents engage fully in their in their auctions and their galas over the last two years. And we'll take some information from before that as well. They've been successful at getting their participants in, their constituents in, um, with low risk and with high comfort. And we're going to talk about how that happened. In the old days, there seemed to be, you know, categories for auctions and galas like, is it online? Is it live? Is it silent? And now the answer is just yes, it is all that. So we're going to talk about how they accomplished that, um, supported by the other two professionals with Bridget, um, how that happened. So the team that you see, sans me, is the team that drives American Tarts um, success in gala and auctions. First, we have Bridget Harmon, who is the national lead digital field campaigns. We have Sam Staley, who is the event gift CEO and founder, and there's a uh, that is the supporting platform for many of Bridget's properties. Um, and he has a great story about why he founded this company that we'll hear later. And then we have Ben Farrell, who is an auctioneer extraordinaire, uh, large work with Heart and with other uh, organizations, and he'll share his experience as well. So audience, you have a role. Um, and if you're watching this later in the garden, you know, digging in the dirt, which is like what I do. Uh, if you have a question, email it then. But if you have a question right now, even one that we haven't talked about yet, that subject matter, put it in the chat or actually in the q and I'm going to say put it in the Q&A. You're going to put it in the chat because that's what we all do, right? But it is actually easier to manage in the Q&A if you could put it there. Um, if it comes in after the fact, uh, email us and we'll do our best to get you an answer. Um, so with that, let's dig in. And I'm going to ask Anna. Oh, there she goes. She's so good. Uh, we're going to just be talking heads today so that you can see everyone's face. And I'm going to start off with a one word question for each of my panelists. And that is, if you only got one word to describe the last two years, what one word would you use, Bridget? Jeez, <laughs> oh, I had to go first. Um, perseverance. Perseverance. I like it. Ben. Uh, gratitude. And Sam? Uh, innovation. Innovation. I like it. All right, Bridget, tell me, um, how'd you get into this gig? Yeah, so I've been with the American Heart Association for, it'll be 19 years on April Fool's Day, so I have a fun anniversary. <laughs> um, I thought they were joking when they offered me the job. Um, but I um, started out as an event they had three titles in the first year. So like event director, logistics coordinator, whatever, you know, um, all those years ago working on our walk uh, and our gala. And then they added a luncheon component that first year. And so I was an event person Then I was a fundraiser. I actually um, fundraised in the Orlando market and then some areas outside of Orlando and what we call community markets. Um, so I did that. And then I was a vice president of fundraising for a while. Um, and then for the last about 10 years of my career, I've been more focused on the logistics and training of things. And so um, I moved into this role a year ago, um, end of April will be a year. And, you know, before that, I was out of the Southeast region, really concentrating on our training and our software rollout. So, you know, someone else at national was like choosing the software. And then we at the region level were figuring out how we were going to kind of adapt it to our region and, and utilize that. And so I oversaw all of the, the training and event new staff hire training for event staff, um, logistics, you know, things like that. How do you execute your event? Um, that was really what I worked on. And so they created a new role, this field digital role. Uh, and so uh, I moved into that at the end of April. And basically my job is to work on um, all of our core fundraising events. So we actually, I work on Youth Market, I work on Heart Walk, uh, Heart Challenge, uh, Cycle Nation, all of our events, uh, Heart Ball, Go Red, and basically anything to do with the technology touching the field. So if we're going to use this as a fundraising tool, if it's going to be used at an event or by our fundraisers, then I work on that project. I'm kind of a conduit between our business technology team and our field. So I'm kind of making sure that, because there's a lot of pieces that go, as we all know, that go into these projects of making sure we look at everything and consider the donor and the user, but also the staff and what's the reporting going to look like. Um, and so that's kind of my role and how I got here. So do you think the digital component component has become more important in the last two years or even three years? Because I know you were already going down a path that yeah. COVID accelerated. 
Yeah, we were, you know, we had, we had incorporated a lot of online bidding. We had incorporated a lot of that, you know, but for years I had heard like, why don't we have an automated registration process? How do we make it more digital? How do we incorporate, you know, technology and have, you know, leader screens and things like that. And, you know, we were looking at those things and then the pandemic struck and, you know, I don't think anyone was ready for the, you know, the pivot that had to happen. And we got ready really fast. Uh, we, you know, we, we pulled together a task force. We did uh, something called a micro battle and we like stood up a fake event. Uh, ben was our auctioneer for one of them, uh, MC slash auctioneer for one of them. And so we, you know, moved very quickly to figure out how to go into Zoom. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, there were a lot of conversations happening with other technology, including event.gives on what else we could be doing to make a more seamless, how can we find you know, technology with bidding was the problem. Cause a lot of the technology out there was streaming, right? Where you like go through YouTube or something like that. And that caused a major problem for our organization, maybe not for everybody, but to all of the, you know, well, how do you stream and what's the team that's in charge of the YouTube channel? And, mm -hmm. you know, not everyone has access to that. There was a lot of, you know, internal things that didn't make sense to go that direction. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, and we don't want just randomness on our YouTube channel. So we, we needed something that created more of a guest experience. So um, Sam, you, you and Bridget kind of landed in the same place from different buckets of pain, it sounded like. Could you tell us um, like the platform that you designed, what experience did you have that said, go do this? Yeah, for us, I think like, most of the event industry, when the world quit spinning, you know, we were all out of a job. Um, so us as a platform that supported events, I think, you know, Ben, you know, the events that you work for, Bridget, you got so, so no one could have events. So we had to look around and say, how, how do we stay a company, right? And how do we help put everyone else back in business? So, you know, our pivot was to say, well, let's stream these things. And what does that mean? So we kind of had to figure out what it meant. And everyone was right. Um, and as we saw people trying solutions that included YouTube Live or Facebook Live, um, you know, we started looking at those to see if they were viable. And for us, in the way our events need to engage, you know, if Ben is saying we need to go live on an item right now, if it takes you 10 seconds to hear that and then 10 seconds for him to back, all those platforms, the latency just didn't work for us. So we kind of had to build our own streaming platform that had zero latency so that there was a, a a no second delay between that interaction so that was important to us and then we knew we had to make it easy and make sure you didn't have to log in here to participate but go here to watch the show so putting it all on one screen was really big for us um so that we we figured that out pretty quickly um and just knew we had to to get that out in the world as quick as possible so that we could all um kind of get back to work and and organizations could come engage their supporters. Yeah. So Ben, in your experience, both with Heart and with other organizations, um, uh, talk about the technology that you've seen and, and what's working, what's not, and the impact of the pandemic. Oh, well, the, the first part that everyone needs to know is that uh, doing something is the most important step, right, is to take some sort of action. The wait and see model uh, definitely doesn't work, right? We're going to wait and see who thought this was going to blow over in three or four months. <clears throat> People say, let's wait till next year. And uh, the first virtual event raised a million dollars. And that reminded me, which is why when you ask at the beginning, what's one word? It's absolute gratitude because it just reinforced everything that we know and believe in the donors that support charitable organizations. They're absolutely committed to making a difference and they will show up when and where and where you tell them to go. And that is very, very important to remember. Uh, what works and what doesn't, there's not enough time to talk about what didn't work. So we tried at least 40 different uh, you know, combinations of different technologies for events, large and small. And what does work is allowing people to engage all in one place, all at one time. So if you can imagine you're logging in, you're chatting, every person has a voice, every person is included. And even if you're not bidding in the live auction, or even if you're not in a position to make a donation, you are there to provide support to the charity that you love. So, which is why event.gives was so successful, uh, especially with all of the heart balls that we had, because mm -hmm. I mean, I laughed about it. I said, if we go back to in-person, what are we gonna do? Pass around a microphone so everyone can have a comment? <laughs> because that was a big bonus <clears throat> that we didn't really, Frankly, we didn't anticipate. That's awesome. What worked was just picking a time and place, getting people to show up, and then finding a way 
for everyone to participate in a way that was meaningful to them, whether it is a small donation, a large donation, bidding, cheering on the bidders, recognizing sponsors, giving support to a person, giving a, a testimonial, all of those things. But the key of all was engagement and engagement is what works. That is fascinating. So you're saying that um, the pivot to virtual and the mm -hmm. retention of that, portions of that pivot, whether it's fully virtual or not, expanded opportunities for both recognition and engagement? Oh, absolutely, yes. Uh, in fact, and the key here is that it's live because mm -hmm. there was a strategy where um, some organizations were, they got scared about live streaming, right? Technology, mm -hmm. what about the mm -hmm. internet? What about these things? So they recorded an entire program and just played it. And very quickly, if you're a guest, you can realize that this entire thing is a recording, I can just speed up to the end or I can watch it later. So that Got element it. of being live connected, we were, in fact, our phrase that we used all, all through the pandemic was we may not be together in person, but we are definitely together in spirit here right now together. And that was the big, I think the big um, positive and the big help for the, each the success. Got it. Yeah. So Bridget, I'm gonna ask you to tell me a story, two stories. One story is a company that bought a table and they're coming to the event and they can't wait. It's going to be great. And the other story for the same event is of a company that also bought a table, but had a COVID exposure and now they can't come. Mm -hmm. Tell me about their experiences. So, I mean, we are honest, you know, as an organization, we are more focused on the ballroom. Um, and so I think, you know, when it comes, what we've loved about the events I guess platform is they can still bid. They can still, so no matter if they're able to be in the ballroom or not, they can still participate in that silent auction. It's a much smoother experience. And so that's kind of our focus right now. We do have a few events that have chosen to broadcast something and so making something available. Um, but, you know, I think all of us know that that's a lift. That's a, you know, a staff lift mm -hmm. to have something of quality. And so instead of just producing something that maybe isn't to the level that the Heart Association normally presents. We focus more on just letting them know they can still participate and find other ways. And so that might be through a post-event sizzle, that might be through, um, you know, just doing the silent auction. Uh, but, you know, for the most part, we're seeing people want to go back and focus on the ballroom. And what was important to us is that we could pivot. So, you know, we, we started going back in the ballroom full force, and then we had a big uptick in January and February. So some events had to go back digital. And what was great about the platform is same registration, same ticket. We didn't have, so that was what we were really looking at is, again, two and a half years ago, no one expected to have to pivot that drastically. And so how do we move forward with technology that allows us to make a choice of in-person or digital with the same registration process and the same sell and auction experience and the bidding process being cohesive. So that's really where we focus. So uh, we, aren't, we aren't doing as much like hybrid, if you Got will. It. Got it. Um, what's your experience with, uh, well, both uh, when Hard had to pivot and with other organizations, Sam, when COVID exposures or, or you know, uh, uptick in infection uh, causes a change? Yeah, I'll echo what, what Bridget was saying. For us, there's no difference. And, you know, okay. that was very purposeful to say, you know, in the beginning, we, no one could be in room. So everyone had to say, how do we go virtual? We just kind of told a little bit of the story about how we did that, how we approached that. And, you know, with, with Ben's help, you know, doing that heavy lifting with us early on, we, we were successful and found that magic sauce, right? Um, and then as we started going back in room, you know, you, you, the term hybrid became a thing. Um, and, you know, the knee jerk was, gosh, now we've got to produce an in-room event and we've got to produce a virtual event. That's a lot of lift, right? And so our focus was to say, you don't, you know, we strive every day to create an experience and support workflows that ensure that whether you're in-room or virtual, we're creating the same experience for you. Um, and so that kind of serendipitously just solved itself to say, you can show up. You're going to go to the same place where you bought the ticket. You're going to participate in the same way. Or if you're virtual, that same place, you click play and you're watching the live show. Um, so, you know, that's kind of how we approached it. And, it. and it really, I'd like to say I was brilliant, but it kind of solved itself. Interesting. Ben, thoughts on this? 
Well, for sure. So in fact, we, the, the key, I think Bridget was the first, which is we don't want to put ourselves in a position where we have to come up with something brand new when we can't predict the future. So let's be prepared that if for some reason, whether it's a city or state ordinance, where we're all of a sudden we're prohibited from being in the person, we don't want to just recreate a whole nother program. Mm -hmm. And so, or in the situation that we had last fall, like last October, we really started getting back in the ballroom, but we, depending on what state we traveled to, you would have sometimes 50-50 participation. So it made it very easy that you could have all of your content ready to go, all of your advertising ready to go, all the registration ready to go. And then if you want to show up, that's great. If you want to watch from home, that's also great. Or like we had last Saturday, we were planning to be in person until the January uptick. They decided to keep it online. No problem. All they did was save a ton of money on food, beverage, and venue. <laughs> uh, no offense to the amazing venues all across America, but they saved a ton of money. Everyone signed right. They were already registered to go <clears throat> and we were able to communicate to them since they're already registered on the platform. Uh, so we communicated to them, let them know what our plans were. They signed up and raised a ton of money. Um, Sam, do you think that the some of the innovation that you've brought to accommodate the pandemic and uh, is improving the in the room experience as well? And if so, how? A hundred percent. We learned so much in going virtual. You know, Ben made a couple of points earlier about engagement. You know, part of what we built to say, how do we make you feel like you're more in the room and we're missing seeing each other? How do we kind of answer that need? And it was, you know, a lot of it was through chat. You know, let's let mm -hmm. you chat with one another leading mm -hmm. into the show, during the show. Um, and that was something that kind of bubbled up that people really liked. Mm -hmm. And how do we now recreate that in the room, right? Um, so we're thinking about tools like that. Um, and we're, we also learned that, you know, seeing my name in real time when I engaged on a screen felt really good. Um, so, you know, we said, let's, let's bring more of that into the room. We have big screens, we have things. Um, so I think we learned a lot virtually about what people responded to and what the dopamine hits we could give them were to say, let's recreate that in the in-room experience as well. I think that's awesome. Bridget, what are the... Bridget's three rules for living in the gala world. Like what's gotta happen to make it yeah. great? So, you know, and to piggyback on what, cause it ties into what Sam just said, you know, I think that the move to streaming and digital, the move to like self-register on that Zoom webinar or on that mm -hmm. event guest presentation, that was a big thing for me that I was like, we can't go back in a ballroom emailing everyone a Word document asking to submit their names. Like, that's what we were doing before. Uh, you know, I'm sure I'm not alone on that. It was yeah. like, where's that Word document or Microsoft form or, you know, whatever you were mm -hmm. doing, you know, as a, as a national organization, we're really careful about like survey tools and things like that, just for collecting information. So it was a Word document. Um, and so that was important to me, you know, moving back in is it, I'm always focused on the guest experience. So one of my rules is how easy is it and how clear is it for a guest to enter and exit our event, right? Like how smooth is that? And then with online bidding, how intuitive is it? Online bidding is such a key component of these type of events that it needs to be, you know, intuitive. And so the, the digital aspect, you know, yeah, we're not really focused on hybrid. That's not something that, you know, we've chosen to focus on, but we are focused on that, that elevated digital experience. I think, you know, where we had paper bidding in the past, I was like, guys, guests are going to, murder us if we come back with paper bidding like it it needs to be a digital experience it needs you know for silent of course live we are still raising cattle but you know it's it's super critical that it's easy to navigate that and so that's always my mm -hmm. view and you know the other important thing of any social event of course is the the connection to the mission and the impact making sure that room knows the impact that they're making and so to Sam's point, we've been talking a lot about display screens and things like that and, and really uh, making sure that that's prevalent in our room. The registration process, our check-in process has completely changed um, to be more digital focused. That also is a COVID thing because that you know what um, event that gives a lot us to do was say like, yeah, I agree to wear a mask yeah. or you know, provide vaccine, whatever the case is at the time. We knew that we were going to need to be able to um, pivot and say, this is our current policy. 
whatever that is, because I, you know, we cover events for, you know, the entire year. Um, and so those things have kept changing and we yeah. needed something that guests would know what the expectation was. And so guest experience always top of mind to me, Katrina, and then mm -hmm. impact to that mission and the impact that they're making. I'm curious, um, is the use of digital tools creating business intelligence that wasn't there before? It will. <laughs> Meaning you're collecting, no, but you're benchmarking yeah. right now. Yeah. Yeah, it will. I mean, I think that we're still, you know, I, I think that the way that we, you know, we've done a lot of work with Event Talk is they've been a tremendous partner and really like thinking through what that guest experience is going to be. Some have taken to it very well. Some guests are still, where's my word document? So it's, you know, just a learning curve of, of things. And so, um, but, you know, it will lead to, to that. Yes. Very good. Um, ben, three rules for living in the good gala world. What are they? Oh, well, <clears throat> number one, you, you better be fun. This event better be fun for the guests, right? It needs to be fun. Uh, the experience needs to be fun. Check-in needs to be fun. Live auction, the whole live auction needs to be fun. It all needs to be fun. Uh, number two, it's got to be meaningful. Like uh, you see, you know, when we when people are producing mm -hmm. content, it doesn't need to be sad. It needs to be emotional. People need to be moved. They want to be moved. That's why they're signing up. When they walk through the door, they're ready for an experience and they want to go along with you in that experience. And so, you know, it's up to the leaders of the organization to kind of pave the way, show the path, and then lead those donors down the path. So if it's going to be fun, if it's going to be meaningful, uh, it's going to be successful. And the number three, I always say like no BS, no boring speeches, right? No boring speeches. You <laughs> want to keep it short. You want to keep it sweet. Uh, these uh, in the current marketplace, Adults don't have a lot of patience for long-winded anything, uh, no matter how powerful it is. So the attention spans are short, so the segments need to be short, which was another big benefit of having mm -hmm. a virtual event. You know, how about uh, all day at the ballroom setting up, and then you've got a six, seven-hour event, and you got a band playing, and people are dancing, and oh, how about a virtual event being uh, raising a million dollars an hour and 15 minutes? I mean, that's pretty exciting when you can do that. And it's important because people are not ready to sit in front of a computer for a very long time. So you yeah. keep it short, you keep it fun, you keep it meaningful, you're going to be successful. Love it. And Sam, from your perspective, top three things to guarantee success. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo all of that. It's got to be easy. I mean, that's a focus of ours. You know, a big focus is say, we have to get you in the door as quickly as possible. Um, our job then is to engage you and get you in front of a donate, a bid button, a buy button as quickly as possible with, with as few barriers as possible. Um, mm -hmm. Make it easy for you to leave. And all along the way, it has to be fun and feel good. You know, we place mm -hmm. a big emphasis on the aesthetics and how beautiful is, is the software we can build. Mm -hmm. um, because people don't want to use something that doesn't feel good. Um, and so I think we're all saying the same thing. I love well, it. I would jump in there real quick sure. too, by the way, and say, not easy, not only does it need to be easy for the guest, it needs to be easy for the organization who 100%. Bridget and her team ha only have about a million and a half things they have to do on their checklist. And yeah. the software is one of them. So if that software requires an advanced learning curve, or you know, a 75 ring binder with thousands of pages of how to do it, that's just not gonna work. So it needs to be intuitive and easy. I still yeah. have those binders, Ben. They're just over here. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the same. It's a, in a perfect world for us, we can automate all of Bridget's processes to the point where all she does is go smile at people and shake hands and, and be where she's most powerful, right? And that's what we try to do. Well, talk about your innovation process. Like what happens to make you add a feature, change a feature, delete a feature? Bridget asked for it and we have to figure out how to do it. I was going to say, he's going to say Bridget gets really loud and uh, I bring examples in all fairness. I don't just ask for things, but yeah. Give me an example. We're, Give we're me an example of something you've worked through together. Oh gosh. Well, the entire registration process. Sponsor tables. Sponsor yeah. tables. So, you know, I think, you know, event I guess was a very individual platform it you know it was a very like I'm attending this one time kind of ticketed event and you know we are a year round come back year over year attend multiple events in the same market um type organization and so and you know I want to register but I don't want to you know like if if Sam and his wife are coming you know I want to be able to do that for both of us you know that kind of thing like it you know we are a we're a very you know uh 
social type, you know, yearly uh, campaigns. And so, um, and we have, we don't have ticket sales. We have sponsor tables. Uh, so, you know, sponsors commit and they get X amount of seats to our events. And so most, you know, tools out there didn't acknowledge that they didn't, they weren't made for that. And so uh, there was a really big learning curve for us to, you know, and, and Sam's team was great at, you know, listen, this is what we mean. This is how it's going. And so we had to find a way in event.gives to say, this is a, you know, $0 ticket basically, mm -hmm. um, and make that registration process really um, seamless. Uh, and, you know, and indicate that, you know, that we still have accounts, like I'm an individual, Ben's an individual, Sam's an individual, but our guests, do I want to bid with that guest or do I not, you know, am I bringing someone that I want to have uh, the same cart or am I not? And that's a, that's a pretty hefty technology challenge that his team has faced. Well, I think that example is also good insight into how the sausage is made a little bit, right? So, you know, what we were saying is we built workflows to distribute the labor and ask people to sign themselves up and type their own name in and email and phone and all those things. And Bridget's team is saying, that's not how it works. We do that for them for these reasons, right? So we had to kind of figure out how do we reconcile that? And we arrived at you know, what was a greater solution and product because of it, um, yeah. you know, yeah. through all of our um, meeting of the minds. <laughs> so Ben, I'm curious, you work with a lot of different organizations and I'm sure most of them, maybe all of them are not as big as heart, right? They don't have the infrastructure, right. the systems, nor the professionals like Bridget. How do you translate this conversation for them? Uh, well, you know, it's the exact same conversation because mm -hmm. what it comes down to is uh, everyone's planning an event and it's going to be at the same place in the same time. Um, and there's going to be one person that's, you know, has the job of managing mm -hmm. the software. In this case, Bridge is managing the software. So yep. I work with a lot of, I call them one person armies. It is one person who you just can't believe what they accomplish. They have fierce teams of volunteers and, and very hardworking committees. And so they need something that's really easy for them to use. Uh, I mean, I joked about the seven ring binder, but I know that that, you know, existed when I first started out in this business so long ago. So for the, for the smaller organizations, you're looking for efficiency. It needs to be efficient. You don't have a lot of time to learn something new. And so as Sam said, much of event.gives is very user friendly. So someone can create their own account. It's just so easy with their name and their phone number, email, and then they're ready, ready to go. And the bidding process, of course, is intuitive. And so for the smaller groups, you just about efficiency, ease of use. Got it. So well, go ahead. Sorry, can I jump? Can I yeah, so yeah. just to piggyback off of that? You know, yeah, we're a large organization. We have, you know, 350 social events and things. But at you know, at the end of the day, that's almost harder to move that many people to accept the changes, you know, when you, you know, I, I, I can hear it now to like my iPhone. I'm like, my iPhone updates on the regular and something doesn't function the same way that it, that it did two weeks ago. And I'm not told that and getting staff to understand that like we need it to keep flowing and functioning and developing. We don't, you know, I don't want the, well, that's our once a year release that that will come out like you're you're behind the eight ball then you know that's taking yeah. too long to to innovate but there's that balance right of like innovating but not over innovating where it becomes too cumbersome for the the staff and the attendees to understand and so you walk that line right of like what what is going to help solve problems but also what's going to rock the world too much and so um i think that's a true statement no matter how big or small your organization yeah. is so if you could go further down that line and uh, maybe talk about how your volunteers are engaged in this process. If you have leadership volunteers at work, I'm sure some of the people on the call are primarily driven by leadership mm -hmm. volunteers. So uh, Bridget, what's your situation on that? Yes, yeah, so we don't have, we have not involved leadership volunteers in this because, you know, mm -hmm. the, the software we had already embraced going with, of course, we have, you know, leadership that we run things by and shares that we've shown right. things to, uh, but it really wasn't a choice of like, well, do you, you know, do you like it? We more of like, we're excited about this. We want to show this to okay. you um, and make sure you understand why we're using it. We've had a, especially with our digital events, we had a tremendous positive feedback on, um, you know, uh, on what we were doing and how we were doing it. Uh, I laughed earlier when Ben said, uh, you know, not to pre-record because every event he did with me last year was pre-recorded, um, except for the live auction and the open your heart. It was super important that that was 
live. So there was a lot of times where Ben recorded in advance and then showed up the day. And I was like sending him a picture that morning, like you wore this, make sure your beard's trimmed the same, you know, like trying to, trying to fake that it was uh, live. Uh, but, you know, we had a lot of positive chairs. I think Ben, you and I did, you know, quite a few digital in my old role. I, I was producing all of the digital events in the Southeast and like we were on many chair. We're just like, this is so awesome that you can bid so quickly that, you know, and so We've had to, you know, kind of pivot the volunteer conversation because I think some table hosts uh, for our mm -hmm. sponsor tables are very excited by this. You have those, we call them like passive table hosts that are like, I just want to send something out to my people and let them register themselves. And so this new process has been great. What Sam's also created is like, if you want to be that, you know, active table host, is, <laughs> you call it a micromanager table host, where they are like selecting each name and putting it in and inviting the guest, you know, if they're managing that list, you can do that too. And it's important to have technology that speaks to both, that doesn't speak mm -hmm. to just one way of doing things. You know, I don't want staff to do it for people. I don't want staff to have to like make Ben an account, but I need them to be able to, if, you know, Ben's a donor that refuses to embrace technology. There, there are a, a lot of those out there. It's getting fewer and fewer, but that volunteer perspective of, I have to be able to do this for them if I have the right information is still super critical to the to the process. Yeah, there's there's always at least one flip phone in every audience. I mean, that's just the fact. I, <laughs> I just removed my dad's flip phone, Ben. He just gave it up. He's 79. I was like, it's time well, to give it up, Dad. And, but, we give them a special salute. One, I say your phone's sitting on 90% battery and you haven't plugged it in in three days. You drop it, you don't care. So there are benefits. Right. I love it. I love it. So Bridget, just to be sure that we were, are bringing the entire audience along with us, can you walk through the experience? Like I'm a, I'm a constituent. I am a, at a sponsor table. Tell me, just describe that experience. You know, there may be people who listen to this, who, you know, don't have their processes built out and we may be presuming they understand a lot of the things that we're saying. Can, can you walk through the constituent experience? Yeah. So, you know, we start with sponsors, right? And so I'm ABC construction, Sam, that's, he's like, do you own that company? I'm like, no, I just make it up every time. So <laughs> I'm, I'm ABC construction. I sign a sponsorship that gets me eight seats, 10 seats at your event. Uh, yeah. We do assign tables at our events. Uh, so we don't have very many like free flowing, um, mm -hmm. mingling type things. It's mostly seated tables. We don't assign seats, but we assign tables. Um, and so what basically events.gifts has done is we send you a link. We're like, we're so looking forward to seeing you ABC construction uh, table host. And so if I'm the table host, I get that link and I can assign who is coming to my table. So as a guest, so if I assign Ben to receive one of those seats, uh, tickets at my table, then Ben gets an email that's like, hey, we're looking forward to seeing you. You have a ticket to this event. And then Ben create, finishes creating his account. He can, uh, if we have a meal choice, I don't advise meal choices, but if we have one, uh, then you can select that. If um, we have a COVID policy, you can acknowledge that. Um, it, it really allows us to ask whatever questions we need to all of those typical things that you get asked attending an event. Um, and then they, they get tickets. And so that guest experience the night of, um, if Ben has completed all of his to-dos, if he's uh, given me his meal choice and all that stuff that we need in advance, and he actually gets the barcode and he gets scanned and comes right in the door. If he hasn't, uh, if he has not been a good technology friend, then he doesn't get a barcode. And so when you walk in the front door, we say, you know, do you have your barcode tonight? If they're like, no, we're like, no worries. Go over there to registration. They're going to take care of you. If you're like, yeah, my barcode's right here on my phone. Great. Sam's standing right there. It's going to scan your barcode and let you right into our event. And then you're in our event. And so um, that that's really the, you know, guest experience from a, from a check-in perspective, silent option standard, you know, bidding and, and all of that. Um, live auction, we are still raising paddles. Um, I think that's, you know, uh, the norm still and, and for our, our giving moments as well. And then check out, they get a text that says, congratulations, you've won these items. Um, and they come right, uh, they can come to check out, they can pay with their cart. They, uh, Sam has a cart program. So they can pay with that um, and, and pick up their items or they can pay with that and go, or we can process that payment on their behalf if they haven't done it. So from, it really is putting the controls. I, you know, I think with previous software, we had to charge all the credit cards. And so now, you know, we're finding, 
I think it's about 70% of people are doing their own. Um, and then we're having to, you know, process the, you know, 20 to 30% that haven't done it. Got it. And just to clarify, Maria Lind asked a question. Event gives us the registration site and does the other functions that you are. Correct. Describing. It's what we are using for our at event technology. So our mm -hmm. um, registration as well as auction. And I just got to know if you don't give a meal choice, like what meal covers the most people without drama? Because chicken I'm, or the heart association. Chicken. Um, yeah. Or a duo plate. I used to do duo plates a lot. I just, the choice, man, like, you know, when I was helping my sister plan her wedding, I was like, no choice. Like it's the chipper chicken <laughs> for everybody. Um, but it just like, sorry, I was quoting father of the bride. Um, but it, you know, it's, uh, ch yeah, chicken, steak, fish. Um, it, it's really, to me, I don't like meal choice. Um, I usually suggest like a duo, but that of course is more expensive. Um, what we find is like, be careful with allergies. Like we'll, we will ask, but don't leave that an open-ended question. That's my other event logistics advice. Say like, you have one of these if or if other, you'll be contacted and then contact them if they choose other. I left it an open field for an internal staff event, not external, internal. And they were like, I don't need this. I don't need that. And I'm like, if you think we're serving that at an internal event, like, I'm not sure where y'all were. <laughs> so, um, so I don't leave it. Don't leave open-ended questions. I think I you've like. saved me many years of my life because I, I left it open-ended once for a very small mm -hmm. event we ran and we ended up having to make sure that there were no feathers in the pillows and no lilies in the ornaments and I'm or in the uh, arrangements. And I'm like, right. <laughs> I didn't right. I mean to ask that question. I, I had like, I don't, I don't need like prime rib or something. And I was like, <laughs> okay, you're not you're covered. It's all good. No worries. Um, okay, one more question. Um, if you have to make a change, like either a pivot due to COVID or maybe, you know, your venue burnt down or, you know, something crazy, what is your process for doing that? Like, who are the stakeholders you bring into the room? Um, how do you weight their opinions? And what kind of time frame? do you try and work with? Well, I know the, the calamity usually determines the time frame, but tell me what that process is. Well, you're asking the right, I, I live in Florida, y'all. So with us, it's hurricanes, right? Uh, it's, it's how do you make that decision with hurricanes? And so we have an emergency response team, of course. And so um, it always starts with the, the volunteers, uh, what, you know, getting in touch with the chair, uh, making sure that the local staff and their SVP, their senior vice president is in the loop with the chair to watch the weather or watch the, you know, in, in our case, it's usually something like that. It's usually more of a natural disaster. Um, we had a lot of tornadoes in, uh, you know, Texas, and we, we've had the fires in California, and then, of course, we have hurricanes in Florida. And so we always start with, um, you know, the, the region leadership really makes those decisions, mm -hmm. not the national team, um, because they're the ones that are most impacted. So the normal process is um, to, you know, make sure that your senior leaders are involved and, and then the the chair is involved making sure that the chair is very involved not that they get to make that final call because we have the safety of our organization but that they're involved in that process and give um feedback okay i love and that so, um we have a good question here that relates to something you just talked yeah. about for the live auction uh, logistically how do you assign bidder paddles if they're already digitally registered and i would add on to that question thanks uh gina for asking this um, how do you coordinate online bidders and in the room bidders? Yeah. Um, so uh, the event, I guess, technology allows us some flexibility here. And so when someone registers, it automatically makes their bidder number the last four digits of their cell phone. Right, Sam? Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and so it automatically yeah. does that, which is nice. It, it does, But, you know, my peeps are all about their heart paddles. Um, they're all about those, uh, you know, standard, really pretty, paddles, you know, they like fan like almost. Um, and so you can override that. And so we um, override the bidder number to be what, you know, 101, 102, 103, um, just like, you know, everybody else does. Cause we have those paddles that we've had for six years, you know, that we bring out every season and go, oh, we're missing 350. Let's replace that one. Um, and so, you know, we, we do that. Um, and so if they're digitally registered, you can override that bidder number. And then as far as um, the ones that are in ballroom and the ones that are not, um, if, we, if we saw the bidder number, there is a way in events, I guess, to know if, they've, if they're attending or they just made an account, there's a, a way to see that. Um, and then their bidder number would be the last four digits of their cell phone. So those bidders are not involved in live auction 
uh, or the live open your heart moment. They're involved in silent auction only. And Sam, um, did I answer that? Yeah, I'll add something because your guys' flow is a little different than ours. We do a little is, different flow, yeah. Because we, we support both, right? So I know for a lot of your events, the paddles are on the table when people arrive, which means they kind of need pre-assigned, right? What we coach smaller events to do is to say, hey, you've got 300 people showing up. Don't assign paddle numbers yet. Print them out. We, we, we provide a, a facility to print them. And we say, if you've got four people checking in, divide it four ways. Each person has a pile. And when Katrina, you show up, I say, welcome, um, your paddle 302, I assign it in the software and hand it to you. And you're very quickly through the door to have a good evening. So that's how we kind of think about paddle numbers. And remotely, the kind of beauty is, you know, if I'm in room and I hold up 302, Ben's going to go 302, I've got you at 5,000, who's next? Um, we can do a floor bid immediately so that people at home see that that went up the bid advances. And when I'm at home, I just simply hit bid. We don't really care what paddle number you are, right. but the system immediately tells Ben, you've got 6,500 now, move to the next one. So that's kind of how we approach it. And you know, it goes back to what we said earlier about how do we combine experiences so that it's seamless for whether you're in room or at home. Yeah, and I was, I was describing just the in room because we're not focused on hybrid, but yeah, I mean, the technology is there that if you, if I'm at home and I hit bid, then Ben gets like on a teleprompter screen, like you have a $6,500 bid from Bridget. Uh, and, and that that's his trigger that, well, that's not a paddle raise. That's a, a an at home person. Um, but I love Sam's solution of like walking up and just giving them a paddle. We had gotten a tremendous amount of feedback that staff or that volunteers didn't want to carry paddles. And so a lot of events had started moving to putting them on the tables. And again, because we assigned tables, that's an easier thing for us to do. Um, and so that's where we coach. But if an event was like, I'm not putting paddles on the tables, then we give them the advisement of then just hand them, just like have a stack of paddles and hand them the, because some events still use the, you know, paper paddle. Um, others are using the, the shaped paddles. Um, and then they can use Sam's other methods. So we do train A or B, but A is our part, is what we normally see. And Ben, could you talk about both um, you know, the experiences that these guys have talked about and anything else you've seen that are related uh, experiences? Well, related uh, to this? You know, we love the creativity and the ingenuity of charities. And they and remember, every donor group is different. Every community is different. You have to honor kind of what the expectations are of the donor. So we did a hybrid event where I think there were between five and 600 people in Houston, Texas. There was another group online and they just assigned all the numbers in advance. So you scanned, like we talked about earlier, they walked in, they scanned their barcode, they walked to their table, they look at their seat and there's their number. So they could use the number. And it's so funny when we talk about this, you don't, no one cares what the bid number is until you get to the winner. We just need the winner's number, right? So literally it's a one, but a bit two, but a go three, but a bit four, you know, you're not even recognized. And so if you're bidding at home, it's all in real time. And it's very easy for the auctioneer to see when the when the amount goes up. And so that part works wonderfully well. In fact, some people pass out um, cards that just have, you know, their favorite friends or table host faces on it even. They have fun cards that don't even assign the number. And so it's one would have been two would have go three until you have a winner. And then you just walk up to the winner and say, what is your information? You update the floor bid that Sam just described. And then that way you record the winner. So... Um, there's lots of ways to do it. The key is that there's flexibility so that it works well for your donor experience. That's awesome. Um, I didn't prep you with this question. I'm going to ask it anyway, um, Bridget. And oh. that is, um, what is considered success and, and what is considered failure in terms of expense to income ratios? Oh, uh, our expense ratio is um, between 15 and 20%. Okay. And um, how were you impacted during COVID when you were not so much in the room? Were they, were you able to keep them there? Did they go down? Did they go up? Oh, well, they, I mean, they, they dropped a lot. I mean, you know, when we were not in a ballroom, when we were digital, there was really mm -hmm. no expense. I think the bigger issue was, um, I mean, some markets did like boxes and, you know, dinners, and I'm sure everyone tried something along those lines. Most did not. Mm -hmm. um and then you know so we had some direct expense there but for the most part they dropped uh the the problem was like negotiating hotel contracts so a lot of things we might have paid and then that got transferred to 2022 or something when we started to get nervous about what was going to happen in 2022 luckily things are looking a lot better but that january february was 
tough. It was a tough two months of like, what are we going to do? And we had a lot of events, events kind of like, let's just move it. And we were like, don't move it. Um, you know, there was a lot of that going back and forth. And so, um, but we haven't seen event expenses um, uptick. That's great. But, ben, yeah. you were very emphatic about, you know, don't put it off, just do something. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of people count on, you know, the third week in February is going to be their hardball in the city where they live. A lot of people count on the first weekend in November is where their event's going to be. And people plan this, they put this on their calendar. And let's be honest, a lot of our major donors are extremely busy people. They are booked for the entire year. And when you start moving off into the summer or the middle of August, um, it's, events can get lost. And so mm -hmm. you don't want to miss out on sponsor. You know, no one, no one's ever uh, sponsored a direct mailing, right? That's not something uh, companies want to sponsor. They want to sponsor an event where we're getting together mm -hmm. and we are celebrating the cause and we are making a difference and we're investing our money. So uh, kind of our advice was we tell our donors we're having our event on February the 28th. Now, if for some reason we can't be together in person, we're going to be together online. Everyone's already registered. You're getting the information. And this was really for the time when when these restrictions all across the country were just changing day by day, when people didn't mm -hmm. know, well, can we have more than 50? Can we have 100? Or are people going to show up? Mm -hmm. or are they not going to show up? So the key was to, you know, give some stability to your fundraising counter. I mean, Bridget said, you know, you've got, and most charities do, you have a gala, you've got a walk, you've got your golf tournament, you've got your luncheon, and all these things have to fit within your, your fiscal year. So let's not throw that out of balance let's just go ahead and give a place for people to gather. That's really it. Your event is a time and place to people to get together. Sometimes that's in person. Sometimes it's online. Um, I stopped using the word virtual and I stopped using the word pivot a long time ago because uh, things are either online or they're in person or it's a combination. And I think uh, just giving that guidance, giving stability so the donors know what to expect is very, very helpful. Yep. I heard a very smart lady say at the beginning of the pandemic, the only thing I can do for my staff is make a decision and remove uncertainty. And yeah. I think that's what you're saying. Um, I am curious about one thing. Um, we, you know, we talked about expense to income ratios and you answered one question about latency. Uh, one of you had used that word, not word and that was about bidding uh, remotely and keeping up. So that was great. Um, uh, Sam, you said something about attendee supported pricing. What does, what does that mean? How's it different from what other people do? How does it impact these guys? Yeah. So early on when, when, you know, I had a vision for, for building this platform, you know, I looked around the market and what was under, what was being underserved were events that were raising less than a hundred thousand dollars. So we, we really said, how can we build software and a model that is affordable for them? So early on, um, you know, we, we said, well, let's do percentage pricing, which means if you only raise $5,000, you can afford us at 3% was our pricing. Um, but if you raise 3 million, we capped it and said, we shouldn't make that much money. It capped at $3,000. So that was our very simple pricing, which meant anyone could participate. Um, Recently, um, we made a shift. You can still choose that pricing, but what we are now pushing is to say, you know, that pricing still asks an event organizer, someone who's trying to support their cause, their job and their goal is to say, how can I produce this event for as little as possible so that most of my money goes towards the cause? Um, so we said, well, let's not ask them to expend money. Let's ask their donors to say, they're already here to give. And to say, hey, if you gave a little bit more, it would help save on platform fees. So that's what we kind of call attendee supported pricing. And it simply oh, means okay. that at the end of the night, when you go to your cart to pay for your donation or the, the trip you, that you won, we simply say, hey, if you'd like to provide some percentage, you choose it um, of a tip, if you will, on top of your cart. That helps us remain free for your organization and helps your support go further. So that's what we mean by attended supported pricing. And it, it, it really has, has been more successful than, than we even imagined. And I'm excited that you know, more and more mm -hmm. events are choosing that as an option. Love it. Okay, two really tactical questions um, for anyone who wants to answer. The use of technology to facilitate these events, you know, my biggest memory of galas is my feet hurt and I'm standing in line. You know, those are like two markers. <laughs> How much do you help those problems by facilitating with technology, Bridget? 
Well, I think the standing in line, I mean, we don't want lines, right? Like I was getting text messages from our first events in January, like we only had three people in line. I'm like, you know, like that's our, that was our big focus on that pre-registration guests feeling, we want guests to feel expected and welcome and not stand in line. And so that's what technology, as we figure it out, there's evolution, mm-hmm. but that's what technology is helping us to do is create that more seamless experience. You know, we don't want someone, you know, we made a change a few years ago that you don't come up to a troubleshooting desk. You instead of a troubleshooting floater, because no one wants to be told, oh gosh, I can't find you. Can you go down there and stand in another line? Like that's not what anyone wants. They, you know, you just lean back and go, hey, Bridge, I need some help over here. And I walk up and help you. So, you know, um, you know, that was that's a change in mentality. And that's the same thing we use to this day. And so I think that technology of just that ease of use in and guests feeling like they were expected and they knew what to expect is mm-hmm. is really key to um, the events nowadays. Ben, what's the what's the change through the use of technology in your eyes? Well, first of all, I, I really miss the fist fights, pushing and shoving over paper and pen <laughs> silent auction. I mean, I don't know about you, but it's such a good time when people that grab the paper and run away. Oh, we miss those days. We used to bring in referees and say the referees are here. It's time to close the silent auction. Paramedics are by the front door. Those days are all over, sadly, but uh, those were some interesting times. Um, well, no. So technology, of course, makes it, makes it just easier. It makes the entire event easier. In fact, um, as we've kind of emerged from COVID, there are a lot of groups that aren't even bringing their silent auction items to the event because they don't want people standing in line to retrieve the items. So you just bid online. <clears throat> By the way, some of your bidders aren't going to be there. Silent auctions are opening a number of days before the event. So who knows where the winners were going to be. And if they're not there, that just means someone on the volunteer staff has to load them up, drive them over, unpack them, set them up, pack them back up, load them up, take them back. So um, a lot of times the silent auction pickup is going to be elsewhere. So Everything done on the phone uh, or done mobily by use of technology, it keeps the donors in control of everything, right? When they register, they're in control. When they arrive, they're just going to display a barcode to walk in. They're in control of that. When they check out, they're in charge of processing their own payment, uh, covering the credit card fees or whatever they want to do. That makes such a big help. And then for me as an auctioneer, the technology that allows everyone to be seen, recognized, and appreciated for their contribution. So when we go to a donation mode, whether it is using the paddle or using the phone on the screen, the entire room sees their name. So if you have a 600 person room and I'm in the corner, I raise my paddle. Yeah, maybe the people at my table can see me raising the paddle, but it's way more impactful when the entire room sees each and every name on that board. So then you're building a sense of togetherness, a sense of community. And like with every fund to need, it's a collective investment. It's a collective gift. So regardless of the size of the donation, if everyone will participate, we're going to be successful. So technology, in my mind, has just been an absolute game changer. And I still remember the day when someone said, I don't know about this mobile bidding, man. I don't think... um, I don't think people are going to be just sitting around the table with their phones out, right? How funny is that right now? (laughs) And the same with um, digital events. People said, I don't know about online. People are going to kind of get burned out of all the screen time. I said, how long have we been watching TV? Okay, people are not tired of watching screens. They just want something that's fun, entertaining, and engaging to watch. I love it. All right. I am convinced that you three are the dream team. I mean, like you just, (laughs) you have all the answers and they're good ones. All right, Ben, I want you to auctioneer us out. If you thank everyone and tell everyone to go get a buyer break and a cup of coffee, do it. I love auctioneers. Go ahead. Ah, No problem. Well, thank you for coming out today and supporting this amazing event, everyone. We absolutely couldn't do it without you. In the words of William Barclay, who famously said, in the short time we have on earth, it is our duty to do all the good we can in all the ways we can for all the people we can. By signing up for this webinar and learning how you can treat your donors better, raise more money, you've done exactly that. And the countdown is on, so let's count it down right now. Here we go. Give it a bit of a five. Here we bid four. Now we bid three. If you're still bidding in the silent auction, there is still time. You just need to bid one more time because when you wake up tomorrow, the item will either be at your house or someone else's, but you're in control now. Did I say three? Here we're to bid two. Now we're to bid. We're almost ready to close it, but one more bid is fine. It's okay for you to put in. This is why you never want to do a scheduled close. You close it when you're ready to close it. When you say three, two, one, and the silent auction is closed. Thank you for coming out, everybody. Get a cup of coffee and a donut or what they say, a, uh, what they say, a Coke, Smoke, or Twinkie break. That's how they say it in North Carolina, but here we go. Thank you all for being with us today.
Thank you, Ben. And thank you, Bridget. And thank you, Sam. We will talk soon. Bye-bye now. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. See ya.